The 10th of May, 1940, World War II, the Netherlands. Nazi Germany invades Holland, and the German air forces, the Luftwaffe, use paratroopers in the capture of tactical points, and to assist in the advance of ground troops across the country. The invasion is accompanied by heavy aerial bombardment of Rotterdam, and culminates on the 14th of May with the destruction of its entire historic center. Because the Germans threaten to bomb the city of Utrecht in the same way, the Dutch forces surrender one day later. Soon after, the Nazis start to occupy the whole country, and pass new anti-Jewish laws, which are designed to exclude the Jewish people from society and restrict their livelihood. 15,000 Jews who fled from Nazi Germany to the Netherlands between 1933 and 1939 are once again under Nazi domination. One of them is Edith Frank, whose daughter Anne would become one of the world's most famous diarists. Edith Frank, near Hollander, was born on the 16th of January 1900 in Aachen, then part of the German Empire. Her parents, Abraham and Rosa Hollander, were wealthy Jews trading in industrial equipment. Edith, the youngest of four children, was 14 when her sister Bettina died, and she also had two brothers, Julius and Walter. After Edith finished high school, she worked in the family business for a few years. In 1924, she met Otto Frank, a German businessman who was 12 years her senior. They fell in love, and on the 8th of May, 1925, the couple celebrated their civil wedding in Aachen, and four days later, on Otto's 36th birthday, they had their Jewish wedding in the Aachen synagogue. The couple then moved to a new housing estate in Frankfurt am Main, where Margot, their elder daughter, was born on the 16th of February, 1926. Anne was born three years later, on the 12th of June, 1929. The Franks were liberal Jews, and lived in an assimilated community of Jewish and non-Jewish citizens of various religions. The stock market crash on the 24th of October, 1929, marked the beginning of the Great Depression in the United States, which soon spread across the globe. It hit particularly hard in Europe, where multiple nations were indebted to the United States. While Britain and France became indebted to the United States during World War I, when they bought a great deal of military weapons and products by using loans, Germany, after the war, borrowed millions of dollars from the United States as well to pay for the extensive reparation payments imposed by the 1919 Treaty of Versailles, which held Germany responsible for starting the war and liable for massive material damages. When the United States called for those loans to be repaid to stabilize its own economy, it threw foreign economies, including Germany, into economic depression as well. The Great Depression also played a role in the emergence of Adolf Hitler, the leader of the Nazi party, as a viable political leader in Germany. Deteriorating economic conditions in Germany in the 1930s created an angry, frightened, and financially struggling populace open to more extreme political systems, including fascism and communism. Hitler's anti-Semitic and anti-communist rhetoric depicted Jews as causing the Depression. Fear and uncertainty about Germany's future also led many Germans in search of the kind of stability that Hitler offered. While the Great Depression and German economic conditions were not solely responsible for bringing Hitler to power, they helped create an environment in which he gained support, and on the 30th of January 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany by the German president, Paul von Hindenburg. It was a moment when the Franks knew that dark clouds were gathering over the Jews in Germany, including them. The economic crisis was also hitting Otto's business, and the Franks remembered well how in the summer of 1932, the members of the SA, which was a paramilitary organization associated with the Nazi party, also known as the Stormtroopers and the Brown Shirts for the color of their uniform, had marched through the streets of Frankfurt wearing swastika armbands and singing loudly, when Jewish blood spurts from the knife, things will go well again. They became even more concerned when the Nazi regime quickly began to restrict the civil and human rights of the Jewish people, who according to the census of June 16, 1933, accounted for less than 0.8% of the total population of 67 million. The first concentration camp, Dachau, was established in March 1933, less than two months after Hitler became the chancellor. Because of business problems and growing anti-Semitism, the Franks made a difficult decision to leave their country and emigrate to the Netherlands. In September 1933, Otto founded a franchise for the Amsterdam branch of the Opecta company that traded in pectin, a gelling agent for making jam. The rest of the family moved to Amsterdam soon after. The Franks were among 300,000 Jews who fled from Nazi Germany between 1933 and 1939. 
After the experiences with the Third Reich, the family soon felt at home in Amsterdam and the girls enrolled in Dutch schools. They made new friends, and despite initial problems with the Dutch language, they became excellent students, especially Margot. While the girls seemed to be happy about their new life in their new country, for their parents the situation was more challenging. Otto had to work hard to get his company going and build a new life for his family. Seeing the development in Nazi Germany, he even tried to set up a new business in Great Britain and move there, but this plan did not work out. However, the financial situation of the family improved in 1938, when Otto started a new company called Pecticon, which was a wholesaler of herbs and spices. Edith, concentrated on running the household, struggled with a new language, and had a hard time settling in the Netherlands. She missed her family and friends, who were still living in Germany, and in conversations, she would often refer with melancholy to their life in Frankfurt. At the end of 1937, in a letter to a friend who had lived next door to them in Frankfurt, Edith wrote, The years on the Marbachweg street in Frankfurt were among the most beautiful. In the meantime, Edith's family, who had been left behind in Aachen, witnessed the violence and destruction of the Kristallnacht, which occurred on the 9th and 10th of November, 1938, when the Nazi leaders unleashed a series of coordinated violent riots against the Jews throughout Nazi Germany and recently incorporated territories. The Nazi SA and German civilians not only ransacked Jewish homes, businesses, synagogues, hospitals and schools, but the German SS and police sent almost 30,000 Jewish males to concentration camps, primarily Dachau, Buchenwald, and Sachsenhausen. Edith's brother, Julius, escaped arrest because he had fought in the German army and had been injured in the First World War. However, Edith's other brother, Walter, was arrested and briefly imprisoned in a concentration camp. Soon after, both brothers emigrated to the United States via the Netherlands. Edith's mother, Rosa, left Nazi Germany as well. She came to the Netherlands and moved in with the family in March 1939. World War II started on the 1st of September 1939. All of Edith and Otto's hopes that they would be safe in the Netherlands were dashed by the invasion of the German army in May 1940. Desperate attempts to emigrate to the United States with the help of Edith's brothers, Julius and Walter, as well as Otto's American friend, Nathan Strauss, failed. The life of the Franks, who were once again under Nazi domination, changed completely. The criminal Nazi regime, from which they ran away in 1933, finally caught up with them in a country which had become their new home and had made them feel free to live their own life. The Netherlands became an occupied territory, and it did not take long for the Nazis to begin introducing new anti-Semitic laws and regulations that restricted the lives of the Jews. Jewish civil servants were fired, and Jewish businesses, as well as the Jews themselves, had to be registered. They could no longer visit parks, cinemas, or non-Jewish shops. Many places thus became off-limits to Margot and Anne, who could not even go to the same school, as all Jewish children had to go to separate Jewish schools. According to new laws, Jews were no longer allowed to run their own businesses, and the Nazis forced Otto Frank to give up his companies. However, Otto had managed to transfer control of his businesses to his employees soon enough to keep his companies out of Nazi hands. But the situation only continued to get worse, and in 1941, Jewish men were arrested during raids and then deported to the Mauthausen concentration camp. Among them were friends and acquaintances of the Franks, and reports of their deaths soon started coming in. Otto understood that the situation was critical and continued trying to emigrate to the United States and Cuba. However, he never managed to obtain the necessary documents. In January 1942, Edith's mother Rosa died. It was in the spring of the same year when Otto Frank, anticipating deportation of his own family, decided to set up a hiding place in an empty part of his business premises at Prinzegracht 263. Regulations which forced the Jews to wear a yellow badge in the form of the Star of David as a means of identification were announced in the Netherlands on the 29th of April 1942. Those who were caught without a badge after the 5th of May of the same year when they came into effect were arrested and detained for a six-week period. The systematic deportation of Dutch Jews to the death camps started in the summer of 1942. Transports regularly left the transit camps of Westerbork and Fucht. Out of 140,000 Jews who lived in the Netherlands by the beginning of the Second World War, 107,000, including little children, were deported mostly for Auschwitz and Sobibor by September 1944. Only 5,000 of them returned after the war. 
before going into hiding, the 12th of June, 1942, was probably the last happy moment for the Frank family. It was the day when Anne celebrated her 13th birthday and received her diary. A diary which would one day make her famous, and in which she would write about her thoughts and feelings during the difficult times that were to come. Less than one month later, on the 5th of July, 1942, Margot, Anne's sister, received a call-up for a so-called labor camp in Nazi Germany. Knowing the fate of their friends and acquaintances, who had been sent to such camps and never returned, the Franks did not hesitate for a second. The next morning, they went into hiding in order to escape persecution. In the secret annex, Edith and Otto were to stay with a rebellious Anne and a thoughtful Margot for 761 long days. After seven days, the Franks were joined by the von Pals family, made up of Hermann and August and 16-year-old Peter, from whom Anne would receive her first kiss. In November, they were joined by Fritz Pfeffer, a dentist and family friend. It is Anne's diary, thanks to which we know how the Frank family and four other Jews lived for more than two years, in a three-story space, entered through a revolving bookcase. The people in hiding were completely dependent on six helpers. These were Mip and Jan Gies, Johannes Kleiman, Victor Kugler, and Bep and Johann Foskale. They were employees and friends of Anne's father, who provided food, clothing, and everything necessary to the eight people in the secret annex between 1942 and 1944. Writing helped Anne pass the time, and it's thanks to her diary that we can get a glimpse into the everyday life of the people in hiding. It was important to be silent, especially from 8.30 a.m., when the men in the warehouse, which was located below the secret annex, started their working day. Any sound could cause suspicion. The morning was devoted to reading, studying, and preparing for their lunch break. At 12.30 p.m., when the warehouse workers went home for lunch, a few of the helpers came up to the secret annex to have lunch with the people in hiding. Meep Gies usually stayed in the office to keep an eye on things. The people in hiding could see other faces and listen to the Radio Oranya, which was a program broadcasted by the BBC, where the Dutch Queen Wilhelmina, who on the 13th of May 1940 had escaped from the invading German troops and then traveled to England, spoke 34 times. While in the afternoon, some people in hiding took a nap. Anne, who wanted to become a writer and journalist, would study or write in her diary. Margot, who saw a future for herself as a maternity nurse in Palestine, also had a diary. Then they had a coffee, prepared for dinner, and at 5.30 p.m., when the warehouse workers went home, the people in hiding could leave the secret annex and spread through the building. They would cook dinner and took turns using the bathroom, as they did in the morning before the warehouse workers started their working day. In the hiding place, Irit and Anne often clashed. In her diary, Anne did not spare her mother and would often write about the disagreements, conflicts, mutual lack of understanding, and her mother's pessimism, from which she wanted to disassociate herself. At the same time, Anne realized that their quarrels were exacerbated by their difficult circumstances, and she depicted Edith as an understanding and loyal mother who stood up for her daughters and protected them against verbal attacks from the other inhabitants. As Anne grew wiser, she managed to keep things bearable and wrote in her diary, I usually keep my mouth shut if I get annoyed, and so does she, so we appear to get on much better together. According to Otto, Edith suffered more from their arguments than Anne did, and even though he was worried about Edith and Anne not having a good relationship, he never doubted his wife as an excellent mother, who put her children above all else. Although she often complained that Anne would oppose everything she did, Edith was comforted to know that Anne trusted in her father Otto. Edith had a hard time in the secret annex. According to Mipris, one of the helpers, she suffered from feelings of despair, and although the others were counting the days until the Allies came, making games of what they would do when it was all over, Edith confessed that she was deeply ashamed of the fact that she felt that the end would never come. The situation became more dangerous after September 1942 when special units were formed, made up of Dutch collaborators that began hunting for the hiding Jews. An estimated 25,000 Jews went into hiding in the Netherlands. Two-thirds of them survived, and one-third was betrayed and discovered. To this day, we do not know the reason for the police raid, but the hiding period for the eight people in the secret annex came to an abrupt end on the 4th of August, 1944. The hiding place had been discovered, and its eight inhabitants were arrested. Two of the helpers were also arrested. One of them, Victor Kugler, remembered how Margot had been weeping silently during the arrest. 
The Dutch police officers who arrested Edith and the others in hiding were headed by an Austrian SS officer, Karl Zilberbauer. While Zilberbauer confiscated their valuables and money, he scattered out the papers and notebooks. After the people from the secret annex were then taken to the Gestapo headquarters in Amsterdam, the two helpers, Miepchis and Beb Voskeel, took Anne's documents before the secret annex was emptied by the order of the Nazis. While Anne's diary and other manuscripts survived, Margot's diary was lost. From a prison in Amsterdam, they were sent to the Westerbork transit camp. They ended up in a prison barracks, and the men and women were separated. As convicted offenders, Edith and her daughters had to do the dirty and unhealthy work of taking old batteries apart for reuse. According to fellow prisoner Rosa de Winter, in Westerbork, Edith was quiet and she seemed numbed all the time. On the 3rd of September, 1944, the Franks were deported to the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. Their train was the last one to leave Westerbork for this extermination camp, located in Nazi-occupied Poland. The train journey took three horrible days, during which Edith and over a thousand others were packed closely together in castle wagons. There was very little food and water, and only a barrel for a toilet. Upon arrival at Auschwitz, Nazi doctors checked to see who would and who would not be able to do heavy forced labor. Around 350 people from the Franks' transport were immediately taken to the gas chambers and murdered. In total, out of 1,019 Jews who were deported to Auschwitz together with the Franks, only 45 men and 82 women survived. While Otto ended up in a camp for men, his wife and daughters were sent to the labor camp for women. Margot, chosen for slave labor, was forced to cut sods or carry stones. At Auschwitz, Edith, Margot and Anne stayed together and depended on each other more than ever before. Survivors remembered Edith sharing her own small amount of bread with her two daughters. When Margot and Anne were temporarily isolated in a separate barracks because they suffered from scabies, Edith and two fellow prisoners dug a hole to pass them some extra food. When at the end of October 1944, Margot and Anne were put on a transport to the Bergen Belsen concentration camp, Edith stayed behind at Auschwitz Birkenau. In Rosa de Winter, with whom the Franks stayed together at the Westerbork camp, Edith found a companion, as she had also been separated from her daughter. In the very cold winter of 1944, the two women were constantly thirsty as there was no water, and in the mornings they had to wash themselves with snow. In late December 1944, the temperature outside was around minus 40 degrees. Edith, who knew nothing of her daughter's fate, fell ill and developed a high fever. Rosa wanted to take her to the infirmary barracks, which was at least heated, but Edith resisted as she wanted to live, and was fearing the selections for gas chambers performed by Dr. Josef Mengele that took place regularly among the old prisoners. However, Rosa took her to the infirmary anyway. But unfortunately, it was too late for Edith. When Rosa saw her friend the last time, she looked like a shadow of herself. Edith did not eat any more and was completely exhausted. She neither spoke nor responded if spoken to. Edith Frank was 44 years old when she died of starvation and disease in the sick barracks a few days later, on the 6th of January, 1945, only three weeks before the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Her daughters, who by then were at Bergen Belsen, did not survive either. Margot, who was in a weakened state, died when she fell from her bunk onto a cold stone floor. Anne died shortly after Margot. Margot and Anne both died in February 1945, owing to the effects of typhus. It was initially believed that the sisters died a few weeks before the camp's liberation on the 15th of April 1945. However, it was later revealed that they may have died as early as February. Because we do not know the exact date of Margot's death, she was either 18 or 19 years old at the time. Her birthday was the same month that she died. Anne was 15. However, there was one person from the secret annex who did survive. It was Otto, Edith's husband. He was liberated on the 27th of January, 1945, when the Soviets entered Auschwitz. On the way back to the Netherlands, he found out that Edith had died. But he hoped that their daughters, Anne and Margot, had somehow survived. He returned to the liberated Netherlands on the 3rd of June, 1945, nine days before what would have been Anne's 16th birthday. All hope was lost one month later, when Otto learned about the death of his daughters. Mip Gies, one of the helpers of the secret annex, passed him Anne's diary papers. 
After he found enough courage to read it, he was astonished by her writing. He also read about Anne's dreams to become a writer and journalist, and her intention to publish a novel about their life in the secret annex after the war would be over. In the end, at least Anne's dreams would come true, and the world learned about her story, as well as that of her sister Margot and other members of the secret annex. First, 3,000 copies of Anne's book, Secret Annex, were published in 1947. Since then, the book has been translated into over 70 languages. People all over the world were introduced to Anne's story, and in 1960, the hiding place which for two years became the home to eight people who tried to survive the atrocities of the criminal Nazi regime became a museum, the Anne Frank House. Today, you can even visit the house in which Margot and Anne spent 761 long days. You can also see Anne's room that has walls brightened with picture postcards and movie stars, which Anne collected, and see her original diary and other manuscripts, which she wrote until her arrest. When Edith perished in a death camp in January 1945, she was a young woman who had to die only because she was Jewish. We must never forget the Holocaust and keep alive a memory of people like Edith, Margot and Anne Frank as well as all the others who perish together with their families and have nobody to remember them. We must make these victims live forever in order to remind us of the dangers of discrimination and racism and hatred towards each other, as history often repeats itself. There were many tears shed for Edith Frank. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Please help us to create more videos by clicking on the donation link. Thank you and see you next time on the channel.